I'm so happy to have Saruthi on the podcast today. Welcome. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Can you introduce yourself and let the audience know a little bit about your relationship to arthritis? Yeah, of course. So uh, my name's Saruthi. I'm 22 and I am currently working as a research assistant in chemical engineering. I graduated last year um, with my master's and I'm starting a PhD in September, which is really exciting. (laughs) Very awesome. Congratulations. Thanks. (laughs) Thanks. <laughs> and um, I've had JIA, so juvenile idiopathic arthritis since I was three. So that's kind of my relationship with it. And yeah, it's been, it's been a long time with it now. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I would love to hear your diagnosis story. Like how did you get diagnosed at that young age? Yeah. So my diagnosis story wasn't very simple, though I feel like it isn't for most people, but um mm-hmm. I had another condition as well called hip dysplasia. So between the two, um, it just meant that I wasn't really making the sort of progress that kids make at that age in terms of crawling and starting to walk and things like that. It just wasn't happening. I was still just rolling on my belly. (laughs) Um, And my parents were really concerned and they kept taking me to the GP and they just said, you know, she's just a late developer. She's a late developer. But obviously by the time I get to three, it starts getting a bit concerning if all I'm doing is what I was doing when I was like six months. So um, it was actually one night I was just in agony, like I was just screaming and my parents took me to A&E and that's when one of the doctors had sort of just a hunch really that I might have JIA and then they referred me and it went from there. But I think between the two conditions, like I just wish they'd pick something up even if they couldn't figure out both of them, just figuring out one could have really helped because I did spend a lot of time in pain. Yeah, I'm I'm so sorry. And when you say A&E just for people who might have a different system is that is that the emergency department yeah so it's accident and emergency yeah (laughs) yeah okay no just want to make sure yeah that's that's a really long time to not be well for a child to be in pain of course and then to not be Mm -hmm. meeting those milestones and like as an occupational therapist definitely hip dysplasia wouldn't mean that people it would it would look exactly that way so yeah I'm glad that at least someone finally looked at something beyond Beyond hip dysplasia, do you have any family history at all of of any autoimmune disease? I'm just curious. Um, so it's weird because when I was diagnosed, they said it's normally genetic and they did like these like tests and stuff and it didn't show that element. Mm. But actually during lockdown last year, my dad was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Oh. But it's quite interesting because we're starting to wonder if that's correct because he has seronegative, so it doesn't show in his bloods. Mm-hmm. And a lot, his diagnosis was just sort of, he has joint pain, his daughter has arthritis, so he must mm-hmm. have it too. But it kind of went as quickly as it came. <laughs> so I'm still not really sure about oh. the genetic component because he he had pain for about five, six months and then he was fine. So, Oh, that yeah. definitely doesn't sound very typical. But mm. yeah, I think with children, I've heard that if a family member has rheumatoid arthritis are similar, then it's more likely to be caught early. Mm -hmm. But if no one else had it, people don't necessarily think about it. So I'm curious because I didn't get diagnosed till I was 20. So what was it like being a small child with juvenile idiopathic arthritis or juvenile rheumatoid arthritis as it used to be called? Yeah, um, it was very tricky to be honest. So between that and the hip dysplasia, I spent a lot of time in hospital. So I never went to nursery, for example, which is um, when you, well, yeah, I spent the whole time in hospital. I like, lived in hospital for a year. I was just having surgery after surgery because oh. even after finding that I have JIA and hip dysplasia, um, they told my parents I'd never walk like ever. So we actually had railings fitted around my house because they said I'd never walk unassisted, only holding on to things. So we had these railings fitted all around my house. Um, my parents both immigrated here, so they didn't speak very good English. So I didn't speak mm-hmm. English either. I didn't go to nursery. I joined um, reception, so that's like the first year of primary school, about one month before the end of the school year, oh, not wow. speaking any English. <laughs> wow. So I had a translator. And at the time, there wasn't very much like support for stu- uh, like kids with disabilities in general. So my mum used to come to school with me every day just to wheel me around in my wheelchair wow oh my so my gosh. dad would work in the day and then uh my mom would take me to school take me home my dad would look after me and then my mom would do the night shift so it was very difficult for all of us I think um 
it was only a few years after when I don't know something just changed in my scans they literally called it a miracle but they were able to operate and obviously now I can walk which is crazy when you think about everything we went through so that made it a bit easier for me in terms of socializing because um you know it's a bit hard to sort of play with people and make friends when you're always with your mum so when I was able to walk by myself and you know it was just me at school not my mum as well it was a lot easier but there were still elements of school that made me feel a bit excluded like PE Mm -hmm. which is like physical education um, because I was always the slow one and you know in school they had this policy where if you're well enough to go to school you're well enough to exercise (laughs) oh that um, is so oversimplistic yeah sorry (laughs) no it's okay I would literally bring in a note saying like from my dad saying like her arthritis isn't doing too well at the moment so please could she be excused from PE and she would literally read it and be like well she's you're well enough to be here so it can't be that bad and then we'd be doing like you know like laps of the field and people are counting how many times they can run past me and then everyone's finished and it's just me left and everyone's watching as I'm like struggling so I found that aspect really difficult um sorry (laughs) it's okay because when I was really young it was more like on the playground you know I remember just sitting on the side and just being like oh I wish I could run like that (laughs) how old were you when you got the operation that helped you learn to walk or be um so I was six and a half okay okay so yeah I started school when I was four to kind of put it into perspective yeah okay but um yeah it definitely helped a lot but it was just so difficult because there were still limitations, um, like sitting cross-legged. I don't know if that's such a big thing over there, but mm-hmm. here it's just, oh, it's just such a big thing. <laughs> and uh. um, I remember telling a lot of my friends, but I used to write to Santa every year and that was what I would ask for. <laughs> so oh. when I had my hip replacement when I was 20, that was the biggest goal for me to be able to sit cross-legged. And I, that was the, the most I've cried like happy tears like in my life because I'd wanted it since I was a kid it was all I'd want because in school like my current you know class teacher might know about my condition but not every teacher does and Mm -hmm. you don't want to sign you want to blend in when you're that young I think and yeah teachers I had teachers sort of tell me off because they thought I was just being disobedient and just not sitting like that but then you don't also want to you know when you're like eight years old you can't really advocate for yourself that much you're not going to be like mm-hmm. actually miss I have JIA and this 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 you're just going to be like okay <laughs> and then like do your best to like squeeze it to a similar position <laughs> that's so sad though like that they didn't understand or take the time to understand I do hope it's better nowadays but <laughs> um but no it's so important to remember like it's not just the physical part right the pain is one thing but like you're talking about the social effect, you know, Mm -hmm. and the emotional effect, um, of, of not being able to play similarly to the other children. And then, yeah, the emotional aspect of being, because I was like, if I think about myself, like I always kind of wanted to do what the teacher said. And so if you're that kind of person and then they're telling you to do something you physically can't do, Mm -hmm. it's such a terrible feeling. So I'm sorry you had to go through all that. (laughs) It's all right. <laughs> Were there any uh, other kids that stood up for you at all, or did you have any? Um, I don't well, know. the thing is, I was so young, like in primary school, especially that I didn't even know that the name of my condition. I just mm-hmm. called it having a bad leg. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's it's difficult, and I I didn't really want to go around telling people because one thing they would do is like some teachers would let me sit on a chair in assembly but when everyone else in the school is sitting on the floor and you're sitting on a chair it's just gonna bring a lot of attention to you and I just really wanted to blend in I just wanted to be like everyone else so I would just sit on the floor and take up as little space as I can so I don't get shouted at for not crossing my legs um so yeah I didn't really have kids stand up for me but I guess I never really gave them a chance (laughs) That's, yeah, that makes a lot of sense that, that you, if you're trying to, to blend in, then you're not going to be like, Hey friend, can you stand up for me? You know, (laughs) I'm just, I'm trying, Oh, I'm just so sorry that this happened. And then did anything help you as a young child? Like with, in, in what we call elementary school, I think you call primary school. Was there anything that any like teachers or other kids did that helped your life be a little bit better or, Mm -hmm. Um, 
the thing that comes to mind straight away is my best friend um, reception. She was called Tabitha. Um, and she used to sit on the side with me and my mum. And it just made me feel like I have a friend. But then she moved and I never saw her oh. again. Oh, but, no. Yeah, I, I'll always remember her because she was my first friend. And she used to sit on the side with me and my mum and just chill with us and, you know, just chat and play like everyone else, but sitting down. And I always really appreciated that. Tabitha, if you're listening, please <laughs> contact info at myarthritislife.net or follow Fight Rheumatoid Arthritis on Instagram. We need to reunite you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, that's so true. It's the simple things, the simple things people could do. Um, at that point, when you're in primary school, did, did, were your hands affected at all? Or was it mostly your hips and larger joints? No, it was mostly my um, hips and knees. And to be honest, for the most part, it still is um, sort of lower body. Okay. Okay. So were you able to do things like coloring and drawing and like fine motor? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They were okay. Yeah. Okay. But again, it was a lot of time was spent out of school, obviously, as well. Because, wow. you know, when you're having surgery, when you're, because ha- that means you have to have pre op and post op and you've mm-hmm. got to have your checkups and you've got to have your hygiene and your physio. So I was in and out of school a lot as well, which just made things a bit difficult sometimes. Yeah, I can't, I can't imagine. And then what was it like um, when you were a teenager having to deal with these issues? Was it similar to the same kinds of, you know, social feeling isolated um, effects like in, in elementary school or did anything change when you were a teenager? Mm, so <laughs> Um, the thing is, when I was a teenager, I was actually in remission. Oh, okay. So in that sense, things quietened down a bit, you know, less appointments and things like that, no more medication. But I still had the effects of my arthritis, my mobility issues. So in that sense, I still felt a bit excluded. And PE, for example, mm. was a big one. And I remember once, like, we had these masks and we were trying to surprise each other and um someone looked at me and said well that's obviously Saruthi because look at the way she's walking oh and stuff like that and it, things like that would just be a reminder like the arthritis might not be like active right now but it's still affecting me if you know what I mean yeah yeah and one of the things we plan on talking about is in having an invisible illness but you're bringing up a good point too that rheumatoid arthritis or juvenile idiopathic arthritis sometimes has is an invisible illness where people can't see what you're going through in terms of fatigue and pain, but it also can be a visible condition. Mm-hmm. So was it hard for you dealing with both invisible symptoms yeah. and visible? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's very difficult because people tend to take things at face value. You know, that's just kind of how humans are for the most part. And, um, I guess as a teenager, it was people were like, you know, the people that I was in school with were a bit more mature. So I could have that conversation with them and I could actually pronounce my condition by that point um, compared to primary school. But it was actually when I went to university that I found it to be the biggest challenge um, dealing with invisible and visible aspects of the illness. Okay, can can you tell me more about that? Yeah, what was what were the Mm -hmm. difficulties? So. Uh, this is quite a big story in my life, yeah. but um, I I had found these people that I was go- in first year that I was going to live with in the next year because the first year you live at the university and then after that you have to move out and find your own housing. And it started off okay, you know, we signed the housing contract and then the crack started to appear. So it actually started one day when they said they were going to eat at um, this food place like near the gym. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to the gym at the same time, so like, I'll come say hi. Um, and then arthritis happened. So, you know, I couldn't walk, so I didn't make it to the gym. I actually had a course mate carry me back home and put me into my bed because I just froze. Um, and then I got a message from these girls saying, well, did you have a good gym session then? And I was like, I I couldn't walk. So I didn't go to the gym and they're like, well, why didn't you come and eat with us then? And I was like, no, no, like I couldn't walk. (laughs) So of course I couldn't come. So it started there when I was like, okay, these people aren't very sort of understanding. And then um, in our group, there was a natural 4-2 split just in the friendships. Like 
there just was. And in the house, there was four bedrooms upstairs, two downstairs. So they had naturally just decided that me and my friend were going to be downstairs, which I would have been fine with. But both bathrooms were upstairs. And with my morning stiffness, it, it just didn't seem like a good idea. And when I asked them, they were very against it to the point that I had to show them a diagnosis letter and they told me that they still don't believe me, which is um, crazy. And it was really difficult for me because I, I was very new to my arthritis again because I'd, my parents had really dealt with it as a child, like, you know, the, every, all the medication appointments. And it came back a month before I started university and I was moving three hours away from home. So I was very new to it myself. So it was hard to explain it to people. And then I think the worst was, um, so ever since I was um, really young, basically, I used to call like flares or like any day where I'm having a high pain day, a bad leg day. Mm-hmm. Um, and I still use that. But um, these girls, they went and found a picture. They went and took a picture with some random guy who had a cast around his leg and they captured it. Now that's what you call a bad leg day and posted it all over social media. And I woke up one morning and I saw that and (laughs) yeah, I don't know. I've never really had my heart broken by a boy, but that really broke my heart Um, because it just reiterates again, doesn't it? Like you look fine, so you you must be lying or whatever like that. People don't really grasp the invisible side and they just didn't understand. They were like, if you can't walk up the stairs in the morning to go to the toilet, then how are you going to go walk to the bus stop to go to uni? And I was like, that comes with time, you know, like when I wake up, I know that I will most likely use the toilet. But if I'm having it, like, whether it's low pain or high pain, you normally need to use the toilet at some point in the morning. Whereas yeah. if I'm, yeah, I might not go to university that day, I might have to do it from home, you know, and they just didn't get that. And um, they'd be like, you, you walked yesterday, like, why can't you walk today? Like, what's wrong with you? And it just made me feel so rubbish, because I, I was like, <laughs> it feels like they think I'm like, attention seeking which is like Mm. I've I've never really understood that kind of logic from people because if I wanted to get your attention or like make myself sound cool then I just don't know why you think I would choose juvenile idiopathic arthritis I am yeah I mean this is such I don't understand it either you know I I wish I did because I think if you can understand it then you can fight against it but Um, you know, why do people not give each other the benefit of the doubt, you know, and trust, like trust that I'm trying my best. I had to make a petition to get my, to get the bedroom I wanted. And one of the girl's mums commented on it saying she has a disabled aunt actually. So she's more sympathetic than most to people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. But it's like, but your daughter's just taken a picture with a random guy with a cast and made fun of my flares because they're not always visible. Right. And I, this is where I get, it gets difficult on social media sometimes too, because I've had people say things to me like, well, so-and-so has rheumatoid arthritis and like, she's running a marathon. Like why like, don't, don't use it as an excuse kind of thing on this kind of like, you know, nothing can stop you if you try hard enough. And it's like, or even people saying to on my pictures, like, or videos, like, oh, you're dancing. Like I could never dance how you're dancing or something like <laughs> not that you would want to necessarily <laughs> no but uh, like um and I'll say like I'm or like how long how long have you been in remission that you could do that I'm like I'm not in remission I'm still in mm-hmm. pain you know I'm just able to do this but it's like we all have to fight our brains and I'm, I'm making like five different points here but like our brain <laughs> has a tendency to want to like oversimplify things you know mm-hmm. or like when I was in college I got diagnosis between my junior and senior year, like my, my second to last in my last year. And my, I, I quit the soccer team because I was not feeling well enough to do it. And my soccer coach was like, well, my friend had rheumatoid arthritis and she still played soccer. And I'm like, you know, at that point her. I didn't, I'm, <laughs> yeah, well now I know to say, you know, that's, that's wonderful for her, but like I'm, everyone's situation is unique. But back then I, I doubted myself. I was like, well, mm-hmm. maybe I am using it. You know, it's just the worst feeling. So that's why it's so hard dealing with people's comments because I think we do it to ourselves anyway. I know I still Mm -hmm. do. Um, It's just so difficult because I know a lot of people, they compare themselves to the old them by, I guess, being diagnosed at three. I didn't have that. But seeing other people talk about how they can, you know, like you said, run marathons and stuff like that. And I'm just like, well, (laughs) maybe, well, maybe I'm not trying hard enough, but it's just not true. No, no, we're, 
we are trying so much harder than most, you know what I mean? Like we have to try hard yeah. just to do the things that most people take for granted. So, yeah, I mean, I think I really try to have this like, you know, um, abundance mindset of like, you know, like I'm so grateful for what I can do and what other people can do. And, uh, you know, so it's like, what, it's not a competition. Like I, I am actually mm -hmm. very competitive <laughs> by nature, <laughs> but I've learned to be like, I'm grateful for, I'm happy for other people when they can do things, but I just, I don't know. Yeah. I really wish I had like a, a, a good life hack for people being like mean bullies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I just... think it was, I think it's one of those things that's so difficult to deal with because now I feel so much more like clued up on my condition and I've come across people advocating and it doesn't seem scary to speak up for myself but before I did have a friend a few friends advocating for me which was really nice mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it was just horrible I I had to I went for some counseling sessions after that actually oh, because okay. um I just I went and I was like, I'm not feeling great and then after a few sessions I was just like I'll be honest this happened to me and ever since then I feel like less of a person because of my condition because I've shown, you know, these people are 18 years, 19 years old. They're not like young, not that that's an excuse, but you know, you'd mm -hmm. think by then people are mature. You know, I've showed them a hospital letter. They've seen me go to A&E. Some of them even come with me to A&E at times. And this happened. And yeah, I just felt, I just felt like a fraction of a person, just like okay. my voice didn't really matter as much. Yeah. And did anything that the counselor said help or like what, what has helped you get out? get not I hate the word over it actually what what helped <laughs> what helped you move past that situation I guess so the counselors were helpful in the sense that I I didn't feel comfortable sharing these emotions with my friends I just mm -hmm. it was a very like vulnerable part of me so it's nice to have someone to listen to me and comfort me but it was very much short-term mm -hmm. solutions as opposed to long-term you know I'd feel better um for that afternoon that evening and then a few days later it'd be back on my mind book another yeah. session and so on but I think I don't know something just changed inside me because after that experience I was like I'm not telling anyone about my condition you know I will just say I've got some sort of injury like I can't yeah. deal with that judgment again yeah and then I realized that I don't know there's got to be someone out there like me as well um that mm -hmm. needs to know that they're not alone yeah because a lot of things were really difficult for me at that time you know I was waiting for my hip replacement I was missing exams because I couldn't walk but then the rescheduled exams were during my recovery period for my hip replacement all this stuff to balance and the university suggested I go part-time because mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to you know manage and my education is everything to me so hearing that was so heartbreaking and I never had someone to look up to or like as an example that you can go to university and complete your studies or anything like that. All I knew was mm -hmm. the statistics that this many kids have JIA, but there was no faces, no stories. Mm -hmm. And um, I spent a good few months just telling my friends, like, I want to do something. I just want to make a difference. I want to do something. And then I started working with Versus Arthritis and NRAS, which are quite big charities here in the UK. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in lockdown, I started my Instagram. Well, no, I'd started before that, actually, but it didn't take off very well because I got some abuse. So I oh, <laughs> stopped. No. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was it was all this like racist stuff. I don't know. <gasps> I'm um, so sorry. But then in lockdown, I was like, you know what, let's let's try this again. And it allowed me to connect with so many people like you. And it's so inspiring. Every time I hear someone's story, it's just like wow you know like they have this and they can still do this this and this because there's so many things in life that I've questioned can I do that and yeah. it's just so nice to have these like examples um like one thing is when I was ever since I was really young I wanted to be an astronaut mm -hmm. um and not one of those you know like childish dreams like I was well into my teenage years and I was still very serious about that and mm -hmm. my friends would be like listen I don't I don't want to knock you down, but it's just not possible. You have arthritis, like, come on. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, one of those people that said that to me sent me um, a link a few weeks ago. The European Space Agency is recruiting and they're allowing people with disabilities to apply. Wow. Yeah. So I think the one thing that I always tell people, if I can, is just don't give up on your dreams just because of a diagnosis. 
Mm-hmm. And I think I just want to put my story out there to try and help people if I can. <laughs> yeah. And so your account is fight rheumatoid arthritis. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize you only started that during lockdown or I mean that you mm-hmm. had, a, you previously started something similar, but then you restarted it during lockdown. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What have been some of the responses you've gotten? Oh, it's been amazing. Honestly. Oh, it's just amazing. I've had messages from people all around the world. Um, I've had people say, um you know hi like I don't know anyone who's young with arthritis but I showed my friends some of your posts so they could understand me better or Mm -hmm. um reading your posts makes me feel more seen um I've had like parents contact me you know trying to get a diagnosis for their child saying like they don't know anyone they can contact really that could help them because they don't know what to do and I know my parents really struggled with that like my dad used to literally just go to random hospitals and wait outside rheumatology and like just ask doctors and like orthopedics and ask doctors like please could you take a moment to look at my daughter's file and because they'd been told I'd never walk again you know like it was big and you know parents parents really do want the best for you and I think you get so desperate so being able to offer any advice really is just I just feel I'm just so happy that people are hearing my story and that I can make people feel a little less lonely because I think having a chronic illness can be so isolating at times Oh, absolutely. And yeah, you've really brought up like the fact that social media, you know, it has some negative aspects to it at times, like you mentioned, you know, the bullying and stuff Mm -hmm. like that, which can occur in person or online. But then the idea Mm -hmm. that, you know, in the past, you didn't have any options to like meet other people with your same condition other than in like various, you know, like nonprofit events, like in person Mm -hmm. or maybe in the waiting room, but now like just with the touch of a fingertip on the computer, (laughs) you can talk to people with your same condition all over the world. It's really, exactly, yeah, that's, it's so, so great. I mean, it really is like, not to be cliche, but it's like, you've taken lemons and made lemonade, you know, (laughs) like taken a terrible, you know, set of experiences and then turned it into not, not to be like positive thinking, like you just need to focus on the positive, but like <laughs> you've taken something negative and turned it into something that is, mm-hmm. you know, helpful for yeah. your quality. I think life. I just wanted, I was like, I've gone through so much in my life that let's let it be worth it for something almost like let it, let it yeah. help me do something with it, you know, because I know I'm not alone in these experiences of, mm-hmm. you know, struggling as a child or being bullied. Yeah. So, but I never had anyone to look, to to see anyone that looked like me or was the same age as me going through it because when I went Mm -hmm. to my rheumatology appointments everyone in the waiting room thought I was waiting with my dad not my dad waiting with me yeah (laughs) yeah it's so yeah it's so true and um I know there's also the element of culture and ethnicity Mm -hmm. that I know even in the online communities um like I talked about in the chronically brown episode that they can be predominantly very like white or Caucasian dominated. So has that been also part of your journey, like representing, Mm -hmm. you know, your, your culture? Yeah. So actually my first time ever publicly speaking about my condition was for an article I wrote for this magazine. And in our culture, it's disability is still unfortunately quite a taboo topic. And it's one of those Mm -hmm. things that you don't tell people um just because they would talk about it so according to my family I was unwell as a kid because obviously you can't hide it when I'm living in hospital for a year and then I was just miraculously fixed and I've been fine ever since um and my mom doesn't want me to tell anyone because it's it's not because she thinks badly of me but she knows that you know a lot of there's a lot of gossip and stuff in our communities and she's like you don't you don't want to have people you don't want to give people a reason to talk about you basically Mm. Um, you don't want them to look at you differently and it was been so difficult because I remember just you know when you're a kid some things just really stand out like I remember once my uncle um, he told me he told me often not walking properly because I walk with my left foot out a bit just because of mm-hmm. my hip um, and he was just shouting at me for not walking properly he thought I was purposely walking like that and I, I had no choice but to just say sorry and like bend my leg inwards and try walk off, quote, normally. <laughs> um, and just different things, you know, like just lots of different things where I just, just have to suck it up because it can be most of the time an invisible illness. 
Yeah. And, you know, there'll be days where I'm like, I'm not feeling well. I don't want to go to this party today. And my mom's like, well, we don't we don't have a good enough excuse for just you not going. We have to go. It's too late. So I just be there like, OK, then <laughs> time to get the ibuprofen out. Because um, there's just such a such a thing about sort of reputation and like, I don't know, there's there's a lot of work to be done, I think, in our society, really, especially in our culture. But yeah, so what I was saying about the article that was a big thing for me having a published article but I didn't put my full name on it because just in case someone found out it was me and it would go back to my mom mm. I was terrified does she know about your current accounts she does like your- but she thinks no one knows about like no one that knows me knows about it oh. which for the most part is true but I've already I've also posted to my personal about it I, it was like coming out post I was like it's time to tell the world <laughs> and yeah. all my cousins have seen and no one's done said anything else gossiped about it or anything but my mom thinks I haven't told anyone because she's literally like do not tell anyone um yeah yeah it's so complex because if everyone keeps not telling it's never going to change you know but yeah that's why your question about family history was interesting because I was thinking I don't know if one of my cousins or aunts had it (laughs) yeah what if everyone's actually putting on this performance of able-bodiedness when everyone's actually in secretly in pain because of you can't tell what the invisible Mm -hmm. and again I'm not trying to be judgmental about anyone's you know culture or or values it's these are all just complex human phenomena you know Mm -hmm. where it's like we want to yeah I think it's very complex yes because I spent a lot of time angry towards my mom for it you know like why are you ashamed of me why are you like trying to like silence me why are you doing this why are you doing that but we reached a happy point now where she's happy with the advocate work I do she's not like it's not that she's not the biggest fan of it but like you know she prefers the other parts of me she's more invested in things like my education Uh, whereas my dad is very supportive of this side of things Um, but she's just like you know you're doing what you need to do you're helping people Um, just don't tell the family basically (laughs) And I think like parents have a very strong protective instinct. You know, my mom is always Mm -hmm. saying, aren't you worried? Like if you share your story, she's always thinking of the worst case scenario to Mm -hmm. protect me. So she's like, well, what if an insurance company sees you like dancing in a video and says like, you don't need your medications or, you know, she's thinking of all those things to protect me. And so I think I can understand why your mom's maybe the same in terms of like trying to protect you from like, Oh, definitely. Like she, told me some examples of like you know an uncle of mine was diagnosed with cancer and she was saying like he hadn't felt well in a while when he went to this party um someone's birthday party I wasn't there because I was away at university but apparently someone just said like wow you can really see the cancer in his face like he's really not looking too well but she's like this is why I tell you not to tell people because they will save comments about you because they love to talk about anything and so it took me a while to really Mm. understand that like my mom does want the best for me but I just think if we keep sort of shutting away the side of us then no one's going to know anything and if we're more open we could actually find a few more family links and help each other a bit more right and like people are always going to say and think stuff about you you know like that's what I remind parents of of children with disabilities not even just juvenile arthritis but other disabilities when I used to work in pediatrics I would say you know kids are brutal like they will make fun of each other if it's for something like I got made fun of for having hairy arms, like, which, you know, I do have hair. I may, I have a lot of hair. I used to call it my parents that I used to call it my fur when I was little, <laughs> but you know, so I, I was super athletic, super able-bodied and like, they made fun of me for arm hair. Like they're going to find some reason to make mm-hmm. people are going to find reasons to judge each other. If it's your, if it's not your way of walking, they're going to judge you for your clothing or your makeup or <laughs> your personality. Like, so we cannot shield each other. There's no way to effectively shield yourself from criticism. I've learned, mm-hmm. I've tried. <laughs> and so we have to learn to cope with it and be like, okay, whatever I'm doing or saying or being in the world is more important than some random uncle's criticism. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that's how I feel. Sorry. <laughs> my <laughs> no. Little soapbox. no, I completely understand. I think my mom was also worried that people would think that maybe I'm only getting opportunities because like they felt sorry for me because of my disability or something Mm. like that as well so I think that's another aspect but yeah like don't get me wrong it's it's difficult um like understanding it but I've come to a place where me and my mom kind of get each other now um because she lives in 
sort of ignorant bliss because she doesn't know that everyone already knows. <laughs> um, okay, well, I will not share this with her. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the people that do know haven't really done anything. So it's not affected me. So I'm living my life telling my story and oh. not feeling sort of restricted by that anymore either. Yeah. And I'm sorry for, I'm now, um, I haven't moved on from what happened to you in university <clears throat> when you were 18, 19. <laughs> I want, I, I, and the people with the roommate situation with the two, the one nice roommate and the four not as nice mm-hmm. ones. What, do you mind sharing what ended up happening? Like, did you find a different roommate? Did you move or did they finally let you live in the better room near the bathroom? What happened? So I started a change.org competition. Wow. Um, and then they finally um, agreed to let me have an upstairs bedroom and so I just didn't get why they were so adamant on having four bedrooms next to each other when, you know, we're living in the same house. But um, then they picked names out of a hat. Like they put all the names except mine because we'd already agreed I've mm-hmm. got a upstairs bedroom um, to pick who else got it. And it just turned out like it just it was quite funny. But the people that were the worst in this situation were both the names that ended up getting their downstairs bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> which I was so happy about but then they got really angry because one of them was like I'm gonna find somewhere else to live and the other one was like I don't mind living downstairs but my parents said that I can't give up my room for you of all people like anything else I'm happy to be downstairs but not I'm not losing my room to you and I was like okay then they got over it <laughs> but living in that house was horrid <laughs> um it was a very hostile situation because me and the girl that I would get on with we would We would stay at university for as long as possible. We would come home at night. We wouldn't cook dinner or anything until they'd gone to bed. So we were Mm. living on a very weird schedule where we would, you know, whisper to each other, like, do you want to go have some dinner now? At like 9.30, 10 and chill downstairs. Um, And then I never saw those people again. Thank God. (laughs) I was going to say, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, I'm so sorry you had to go through that. Like, I just, I... I feel, I guess, really fortunate that that hadn't happened to me as a, as a young person. I mean, maybe people were judging me, but they just didn't say anything, but, um, ugh. it was just so difficult because like the whole thing was so bad, but the sharing that picture with someone else with them, you know, that was the worst for me, but they somehow just managed to convince everyone that it was okay because they were drunk. And I just, I just hate that people, when people do that, you know, like, yeah you weren't you you weren't drunk you weren't that drunk that you couldn't you know log into your phone ask a random person for a picture make that caption post it like you know and I yeah they thought that sober (laughs) exactly exactly and this was so you're you're 22 so this was only a few years ago Mm -hmm. wow okay because that's that's a lot of like growth since then like I'm just imagining (laughs) how isolated you must have felt and then now you are like a little bit not to oversimplify it but now you have you know you're more confident in advocacy but also like Mm -hmm. you have this community of others you know and you're not Mm -hmm. as alone anymore so I'm glad that that's at least maybe that gives people hope who are going right now going through that terrible Mm -hmm. experience of you know isolation and um that you know it can change pretty quick in a positive Mm -hmm. way definitely Um, and did you just finish your undergrad or your, your university last year? Mm-hmm. Or- yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I finished last summer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing some people will be wondering, were there any tips or tricks you used to survive, you know, university as somebody with, mm-hmm. you know, additional needs? Yeah. Um, so I think the main thing is make sure you tell people your condition. I know it's difficult, but I remember when I first started, um, because I put on my application, I have a disability, they make you have an appointment with like the disability staff. I think it's called like student advisor or something. Mm-hmm. And they were like, do you need any like help with your arthritis? And I was like, nope, absolutely fine. <laughs> absolutely fine. Just put me in the example with everyone else. You know, they were like, we can put you in a separate room. Um, we can give you a better chair. And I was like, nope, don't want to be singled out because, you know, just want to blend in (laughs) right but um when I started struggling quite a bit because obviously when I had this appointment I'd have my arthritis been back for a month I was in denial I actually decided the Uh best thing to do when your arthritis comes back with a vengeance was to sign up for the women's rugby team (laughs) okay (laughs) 
Um, not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> There's really um, a stubborn streak in us. I, the people with rheumatoid arthritis, I'm convinced we have a very stubborn streak because that's something yeah. I would do too. <laughs> yeah. Like I remember my friend told her brother, who's a doctor, and apparently he just laughed because he thought it was a big joke. And I, she was like, no, really, like she's doing this. And I was like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when I started struggling, I was really lucky that my personal tutor, so they're like your first sort of... Um, sort of contact really when you need help with anything not just academic you know just university related but um yeah my personal tutor I think she had some sort of joint condition as well she never said but she, you know from the way she talked I could tell that she could relate and she would go above and beyond for me and that really changed everything for me because sometimes I'd wake up and I'm flaring and I literally can't walk and I've got an exam and she gave me a phone number and I would literally just call her and she'd be like leave it with me I'll sort it out and she sorted it so that I could reset my exams in what's normally like reset period but I'd sit it as a first sit because okay. normally in reset period um they get capped but I obviously didn't sit it in the first place and things like that so definitely sort of tell people what you need or even if you I didn't know what I needed I think that's why I said nothing but if you tell people how the condition affects you then they can try help find things that will help you because yeah. I think sometimes we don't always know what help we need. So yeah. we're just kind of like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's great that you had that. Um, would you say they were a tutor? Yeah. What are they called? Yes. Yeah. That's, that's not something I don't think is always available in the U.S., but at least telling, um, you know, disclosing at your university or, or college that you, that you need accommodations is, is so important. And like I always say, I am an optimist by nature, but with these kind of issues, you want to be actually like a pessimist, like plan for the worst, <laughs> like yeah. think about what would happen if it gets really bad. Cause like yeah, when I started my master's, I was in remission, but then things, so I didn't, I didn't disclose anything, but then of mm -hmm. course things got worse. And then I, I mm -hmm. but I, I still didn't end up having to alter too much. But if I had, if I was going back now, like if I was getting my master's now, I would have to uh, yeah. disclose for sure. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, always err on the side of, of caution. And I'm so curious about, you said you're going to get your, you're going to start your PhD program in, what was it again? Chemical? In chemical engineering. Yeah. In September. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. So can, what, I'm just curious, um, what made you choose that field? Um, so yeah, I did my degree in chemistry and I was really interested in like pharmaceutical formulations. So I did my master's project on that. And it was just so exciting because it was a new like field of chemistry that I'd never come across before. Because um, until I was a few months in, I was still doing final stage interviews for like patent attorney and stuff like that, where oh. I'd use my science, but not really. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. And then I found this and it was so exciting. Like it would be my reason to get out of bed in the morning because I'd made something that no one had made before. And it was the most exciting thing to me. Like unless you, unless you care about like this specific field, it doesn't mean anything. But to me, it was everything. You know, I'd be like, oh, my God, like labs open at nine. I can go see my results. Like, oh, my God, what have I made today? <laughs> That's so and, cool. I've never done anything like that. So I'm just fascinated. <laughs> yeah. So after a while, I was like, oh, this project finishes in four months. It ended up being three because of COVID. But um, I, I kind of want to do this for a bit more. So then I was like, I started looking into PhDs because you can do it for another four years and they pay you to do it. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's pretty so, smart. Yeah, I'm doing my PhD. And so it's chemical engineering, just because I'm now looking at the scale up process. So it's actually going to be in collaboration with AstraZeneca, which is so cool. Wow. Yeah. Well, it made me think pharmaceutical. I'm, I'm, I think people are going to be curious. Um, what, how are you medically managing your juvenile idiopathic arthritis now? Are you on any medicines, if you don't mind mm -hmm. sharing? Or Yeah, of course. Um, so I'm on tozolizumab um, in fact, infusions. I was going to say I just started then. that last week. I'm sorry. This is about you. I just I'm saw excited. your comment on another yeah. post. I can't remember. Uh, I can't remember. Yeah. Daniel's. Yeah. Um, I just saw your comment and I was going to message you after this anyway. But yeah, yeah it's been a miracle drug for me, really. Oh. It's it's difficult because um, my rheumatologist wants me to try something else just because I have uveitis. So I have inflammation mm -hmm. in my eyes. And although my joints are the best they've been, I still get some swelling here and there. And I still have inflammation in my eye. So they're like, you know, we want to see if something could work better. But for me, this is the best it's ever been. You know, 
basically no side effects other than every now and then my white blood cells will drop a little low but they recover mm-hmm. okay and mm-hmm. um just like straight after the infusion I'm normally quite tired mm-hmm. but even that you get kind of used to after a while like I remember the first one I had I slept for like 13 hours and now I just sleep an hour longer and I'm okay mm-hmm. but it's yeah it's been like a miracle drug for me because it's it's the lack of side effects for me I think um yeah. And I thought, you know, oh, I have to go to a hospital instead of just self-inject. But I actually think even though the infusion is longer than one injection, um, like an injection only takes like a minute, but mm-hmm. I had to really amp myself up for that every time. And you'd feel the side effects four times a month instead of once a month. Like mm-hmm. with COVID, they wanted me to stop my infusions and do injections. And I was like, I'm experiencing the f- tiredness, but more often. So like, it's just not ideal for me. So yeah, Tuzlizumab has been really great for me. <laughs> Yay. Oh, that's so, that's so great to hear. And um, yeah, I, w- I didn't share too much about it because I wanted to wait until I like tolerated the first couple injections mm-hmm. just because I didn't want to have, like, I didn't want to have to keep like providing updates if I like was having some sort of weird mm-hmm. reaction or anything, but, but yeah. anyway, but I'm so glad to hear, you know, it's, it's, it's working for you. And I mean, one of my one of my educational missions is just, yeah, helping people and make like um, access like balanced information about the medications, you know, because mm-hmm. there tends to be on social media, like you tend to get the extremes, right? Like the wonderful mm-hmm. e- experiences, but then also a whole bunch of, ex- of like stories about terrible side effects. And so mm-hmm. it can be hard to know like what's the average, like, you know, most common yeah, of course. experience. Yeah. So. Um, but I think for the people who are really scared, which is totally normal to be scared, especially before your first medication, like for some people, this is their first illness diagnosis, Mm -hmm. you know, since maybe like an ear infection when they were little. So (laughs) for, for me, it's become so normal, you know, just like, Oh, give an injection. No big deal. Oh, add another pill. You know, I don't really care. Like, honestly, I'm just very blase about it. I think the best um, thing to come out of my diagnosis is I think I am actually over my needle phobia, which is crazy. Because I remember in school, we used to have like, we had to have some sort of jab. I can't remember what it was, like cervical cancer jab or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But um, I was literally running away from people. Like I was literally like screaming and crying and kicking. And I had four people, like four of my friends hold me down while the nurse put it in. And I spent like an hour crying. Like my needle phobia was really bad. But now I'm just like, I don't like to look. I still don't like to look. I just don't see why you would want to. But I could do it and I, I don't cry every time. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. No, it is exposure therapy. It, it works. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, this is this is so great. So I'm glad that's working. That's working for you. Another thing I think people might want to know um, is like, what is a day in the life like for you? I know that every day is probably a little bit different, but mm-hmm. um, you know, in terms of managing your JIA today, is um, like, do you? even though you were saying that you have like pretty good disease control right now with your medications, but do you still have, do you still do anything like a hot pack or just any lifestyle? Oh yeah. Things? Like, yeah. I think when I say have pretty good control, like I still flare a few times a month, which is not really the best example of well-controlled JIA, but considering how bad it was, considering being bed bound most days a week for me, it's, you know, it's freedom and yeah. it's, I really didn't, do well on my previous medication so for me this is the best it's been but I still do a lot to kind of help with that so I yeah I was actually thinking about this before I called but I do so many things to make things easier for myself in a way so like I every morning I fill up my flask with hot water so the night before I will already like fill up the kettle with water so in the morning I just have to flick the switch because with my hands recently they're feeling a bit weak so sometimes I keep dropping things so that was for me like you know, sorting it out the day before when I'm feeling better. Um, I set my alarm for about 15, 20 minutes before I need to actually get up and shower so I can get a bit of time to sort of stretch my legs in bed a bit because I find it hard to just, waking up's fine, but getting up is still a struggle. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And I use sort of, I do use some like CBD balm sometimes. Um, I use heat packs or ice packs depending on what type of pain because some pain I feel like heat packs help but then some pain is like it feels like my joints are burning in which case I need ice (laughs) exactly Um, same for me yeah yeah 
but yeah every day is different in terms of pain but it's just those little things that really help me you know like sort of planning ahead um like if if I'm not feeling great the night before then I will plan my outfit so that I have loose bottoms because I can't tell you how many times I've tried to get into bottoms and they overnight don't fit me because my knees are so swollen so oh, just yeah. things like that <laughs> But they really add up all the little, Mm -hmm. little life hacks or just adaptations you do during the day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Add up by the end to where you've saved yourself a lot of pain and energy. So that's great. What about fatigue? I'm curious, uh, do you have struggle with fatigue at all? Yeah, definitely. It's one of the hardest aspects because when your pain levels are low, like I don't know, but for me, I just, I'm just like, I've got to make the most of it. I want to do this, 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 and this, this, this. Mm-hmm. Basically got like a checklist of things to do when I'm feeling better. But then with the fatigue, I'm just like, all I want to do is lie in bed. And then I feel a bit guilty sometimes because I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm not making the most of a low pain day. But yeah, the fatigue can be really bad, you know, just, it's just that never ending exhaustion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel personally, I feel like there's more like life hacks or tools for pain available mm-hmm. then for fatigue you know I it's kind of like yeah because even though <laughs> yeah because even though I've had JIA since I was three I didn't know much about fatigue until literally last year when I started my Instagram I just thought everyone like in the world just felt tired a lot of the time you know yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I was just well tired like oh I'm not sleeping well that's why okay I only slept seven hours that's why but now I realize it's it's kind of tiredness that sleep can't fix <laughs> Exactly. Uh, I didn't know that fatigue was, my fatigue was from rheumatoid arthritis yet till I was like literally reading a textbook in my master's in occupational therapy program. And it was like, the fatigue comes from the autoimmune nature of the disease. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, um, and I, but I always joked that I was a sleep diva. Like I always, like I was very protective <laughs> about my sleep and I mm-hmm. always made sure to like get a good night or try to get a good night's sleep. But I could just see how, I mean, fatigue is different and very distinct from sleepiness but adequate sleep can help you, your fatigue, not feel as intense to me mm-hmm. at least. So, um, it kind of compounds like lack of sleep compounds fatigue. Oh, sure. definitely. Yeah. So being really diligent about the sleep has, has helped, but yeah, there's just not and you know, I know that I talked to Jen Horajeff, who's does, um, helps people connect to research opportunities. And she also actually has her PhD also, but she, um, said that, you know, she's trying to push for like these, the FDA to look at whether these medications are, at, or it can be approved for fatigue as well as pain. Cause actually all the medicines for rheumatoid arthritis that are, they're FDA approved for the pain in the underlying disease control, but they're not necessarily uh, approved for fatigue. And mm-hmm. they used to think that fatigue and pain both have the same underlying mechanism. Like it's inflammation from the autoimmune process causes mm-hmm. both pain and fatigue, but it's, it's actually more complicated than that, right? Pain and fatigue can go together or you can have one and not the other. And so uh, sometimes yeah. you know how, like when your pain is totally okay, but your fatigue flares up mm-hmm. or your fatigue flares or your pain flares up, but your fatigue doesn't flare up. And so um, I think people are still trying to figure that all sort it all out, but yeah, I just, I've always tried to ask about fatigue because it's like the forgotten symptom, you know? Yeah. literally. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, and just because we need to wrap it up sadly, cause I, I want to talk to you forever, but, um, uh, <laughs> do, is there anything else you wanted to like, let the audience know or share? This is your chance to go on any soap boxes you might want to go on. That's one of my favorite <laughs> times. Like, now that I have your attention, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, to anyone listening, just keep going. Like, it's so difficult, like, mental health side of things as well. Yeah. Like, so, you know, sometimes it just feels like you're in a really dark place, but things do get better. Like, and I'm not saying that everything in your life's going to be fixed, but you will become stronger and feel more equipped to deal with that. Like, one way or another, I think things start to even out a bit and I always think of it as like when something's bad like what goes down must come up is what I say (laughs) even though people don't say the opposite but (laughs) yeah that's true what goes up must come down what goes down must come up I love that I love that or I love the other one where it's like um when you hit rock bottom keep going because it's kind of like okay well then there's only one direction you can go now which is kind of back up hopefully I think that's what that means 
Um, I think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is there any other, um, I was just thought of this, any other like resources that you found helpful? Like I know you mentioned versus arthritis. Mm -hmm. Um, what was the other one, or was there another nonprofit that you've helped? Yeah, um, NRAS. So it stands for National Rheumatoid Arthritis Society. Oh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, they're really good as well. They've actually got a whole week on this week of, you know, um, Wear Purple for JIA, like a well-being week in raising yeah. awareness. And they're amazing. Um, and their pages have a lot. And also just loads of Instagram pages such as yours. <laughs> oh, oh thank you. yeah. Is there any Instagram pages that you love like mine? No, but yeah, that's, that's, that's great. I mean, that's, um, I think people like hearing from other human beings, right? Like you were saying, mm -hmm. like, we want to like connect to an individual and, and share stories. So, I mean, I, I appreciate your page. You have a nice blend of like humor. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> often missing, right? Because we can get so down about things and humor can just kind of like shake you out of it almost. And like, Oh, hundred percent. Like I, yeah. I always say, if I don't laugh, I'll cry. So, you know, I'd rather yes. laugh. <laughs> yes. Um, and yeah. it's just, I don't know. It's just, sometimes it's just good to take a step back and just take a more lighthearted approach, I think. Yeah, totally. And so I will be putting all these um, no, uh, links in the show notes, but um, where can, just to say it out loud, where can people find you on Instagram and other so places? I am fight rheumatoid arthritis. And for the moment, I'm only on Instagram. So you can find me there. Well, I'm sure you may, if you do expand to like a website or, or anything else, I will be sure to update the show notes for <laughs> that. But thank you so, so much for your time. No worries. Thank you for having me. Like I've been so excited for this. Yeah, I'm so glad the day is finally here. <laughs> I've been excited too. Okay, well, we'll uh, hopefully everyone can connect to Sarufi on Fight Rheumatoid Arthritis on Instagram. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>